Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's Director of Alumni Relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences, regardless of your location. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's featured presenter, Distinguished Professor and Daniel Kirkwood Chair of Astronomy, Katie Pilachowski. Professor Pilachowski is an observational astronomer who uses large telescopes in Hawaii, Arizona, and Chile to study the chemical evolution of stars. Specifically, her research focuses on the compositions of different populations of stars. Different populations of stars differ from each other due to the different histories of star formation. Before joining the IU faculty, Professor Kalachowski worked at the National Observatory in Tucson, Arizona, where she helped build the 3.5 meter wind telescope that IU astronomers use for their research. Following her talk, Professor Pilachowski will be joined by IU alumnus Gary Kovner for the audience Q&A session. Dr. Kovner earned his bachelor's in physics from IU in 1968, and he also holds a PhD from the University of Missouri. Dr. Kovner had a 30-year career in industry and is a member of the college's Executive Dean's Advisory Board. He remains a loyal and active IU alumnus in the Chicagoland area. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion. Simply click on the Q&A tab located in your webinar toolbar. Hover your mouse over your screen and your toolbar should appear. Closed captioning is also available. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Pilachowski for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. It's honestly a pleasure to be here and to share some of the excitement of astronomy with all of you. Um, this is an amazing, has been an amazing year for us. It's been almost 12 months since the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope were released to the public. And um, it's just been exciting ever since. So it's really a thrill to, uh, to share all of this with you. I am going to talk a little bit about the telescope itself. Uh, and to show sort of how it's working, why it's working, sort of it, it's an unusual facility, um, and then go into some of the exciting results that we've seen peering over the last year. So one of the questions that comes up all the time is why, if we have telescopes in space, why do we need telescopes on the ground? And, and I want to explain from the astronomer's perspective exactly why we need both of these, both space and ground. In order to really understand the universe out there, it's a very complicated place. There are a lot of weird and strange objects out in space, but they all uh, radiate light or shine at different, different wavelengths of light. And so in order to understand the universe, we really want to be able to see the entire electromagnetic spectrum from gamma rays all the way through the longest radio waves from the, the coolest objects and largest objects in the universe. And our own atmosphere is kind of in the way of our ability to see the universe out there at many of the wavelengths that we want to study. And this particular chart, it shows the transmission of the atmosphere from the, the highest energy light, the gamma rays, all the way through those longest wavelength radio waves on the right-hand side. And the gray regions are regions where our atmosphere is opaque, that we're really unable to see through to study the universe outside. So there are uh, regions, oh, and I guess I should say on, on the uh, vertical axis, altitude in kilometers, basically shows how high you have to be in order to see uh, what's out there uh, beyond our atmosphere. So at the very shortest wavelengths, we can, we can get up to uh, altitudes of 30 or 40 kilometers and, and actually be able to see what's out there. But at shorter wavelengths, we need to go out to space, uh, particularly in the ultraviolet and in, in the X-ray. Um, as we move into the optical band, and that's that sort of rainbow thing going up and down in the middle, the atmosphere is pretty transparent. That's not a coincidence. Of course, our eyes are designed to see light, which actually reaches the surface of the Earth, penetrates through the atmosphere. And so the visible band is, is straightforward, and we can see the universe pretty well from the ground, particularly from mountains uh, at, at high elevation. We have a good view of the universe going out. But as we go again to shorter wavelengths, we run into this region in the infrared, where we see major sections of the spectrum are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. We have to get up to very high altitude to see. And then we go out further into the radio, further to the right in this diagram, 
And we can pretty much see all of space from the ground. We don't need so much to go into space to see those wavelength regions. So in order to really study across the universe, we really need to be in space, particularly in the ultraviolet and in the infrared part of the spectrum. And so we are desperately need space telescopes and ground-based telescopes. Ground-based telescopes are less expensive to build uh, than, than large space telescopes, and we can also build them significantly larger. And that provides an advantage in many cases. So a combination of both space and ground is important for astronomy. The other reason that we want to be in space is because we are actually above the atmosphere. And that means that we're above the effects of the Earth's atmosphere on the images that we can study. So if we start at the ground, we're looking at um, a lot of sort of blobs of air that move around at different velocities, different sizes, and change how light passes through the atmosphere. That light gets defocused, basically, in in sort of an odd sort of blobby kind of way by the motions of different regions of temperature and density in the Earth's atmosphere. And that means it's very difficult to get really sharp images looking up from the ground through the atmosphere. I've added two pictures of Jupiter here on the right-hand side, one from the ground and one from space. And you can sort of see the difference of, of how much sharper those space images are. And that has to do with the fact that we're above the Earth's atmosphere and we're able to see much sharper things. Of course, those telescopes in space are smaller. It's hard to build really big telescopes in space. So we don't collect as much light. And there are trade-offs, both plus and minuses for space and the ground. Fundamentally, both of them turn out to be important for astronomy. James Webb Space Telescope is our newest, uh, greatest telescope in space. It was launched about a year and a half ago, and it has a mirror diameter of 6.5 meters. Let me put that into context. Um, the largest telescopes on the ground are about 10 meters in diameter. The Hubble Space Telescope is about two and a half meters in diameter. So this is about three times larger in diameter than the Hubble Space Telescope and um, more than, than four times bigger in area. So it collects a lot of light. Unusually, it's coated with gold. The mirror segments in this telescope are coated with gold. And that's because this telescope is designed to work in the infrared. Um, and it's designed to look at wavelengths of light where if the telescope is warm, light from the telescope itself would swamp the uh, um, images that we want to want to see. So the Hubble Space Telescope is a very unusual instrument. Um, you see that huge heat shield that's at the bottom. We'll come back to talk about that. Telescope itself is a relatively simple, a complicated but simple optical design. Uh, it's got that large primary mirror, the gold hexa hexagonal segmented mirror. Uh, it collects the light from space, focuses it up above the telescope, or actually to the right in this particular, to the yeah, to the left in this particular image. Um, and there's a mirror at the top of that sort of pyramidal structure, the three arms that are holding up a small mirror. That mirror reflects light back down through a hole in the center of the large primary mirror to the instruments that are mounted behind the telescope. So just in context, here is an image of the Hubble primary mirror the James Webb primary mirror, and some uh, ordinary things that we encounter in space or in life on the ground, a school bus about the size of the Hubble Space Telescope and a, a large a jet liner, which is about the size of the James Webb Space Telescope. This mirror is segmented. It has 18 segments that combine together to produce uh, the images, the full-size mirror that we need to collect observations. And this telescope was designed to collect light from wavelengths of 0.6 to 2 to 28 microns. Our eyes can only see a little bit longer wavelength than about 0.6 microns. So this telescope actually sees light that is invisible to our eyes for the most part, going from, from pretty much red wavelengths out to much, much longer wavelengths in the infrared where our eyes are not sensitive, but the universe is very bright. So it's an important telescope for accessing that infrared part of the spectrum. The telescope had to be built in these kind of funny segments, all folded up so that it fit inside the fairing of the rocket, which launched it. So it's you can see in the scale here of, of the people down at the bottom of the image on the left, uh, how big the telescope is, even folded up in those mirror segments. Um, it's folded inside the fairing in the middle image there, ready for launch. This is an artist's conception and also an artist's conception on the right-hand side showing how the telescope is released. The fairing is 
and is separated after launch above the Earth's atmosphere. Telescope is released and then sent on its way to uh, where its location is supposed to be. I wanted to try to share this video of its last moments visible to us on Earth after launch. So there are cameras that were located on the launch vehicle. We can see the separation of the Hubble, of the James Webb Space Telescope from the launch vehicle, and it moves off into space. And let me go on, and we can see it from um, a different perspective than the flag. I'm a little bit further in this video. Where's my person? There we go. Um, there we can see it from a different camera angle, moving away from the launch vehicle. And then move it fast into space, moving away from the launch vehicle on its way out. There we see the panel unfolding, uh, the, the uh, tank cells that provide power for the spacecraft, and basically our last view of the spacecraft on its way from Earth out into space. As it's moved out there, we've had to unfold the whole thing. Let me go and on. To, here we go. Oh, back, here we go. Back one. There we go. Um, the whole telescope then has been folded up inside the rocket fairing. It needs to unfold itself. And that's a very complicated sequence of operations that had to happen. So, th so this is how it's supposed to work. But as it starts out, it um, is all folded up and begins to unfold. So here is the power cells moving outward. Uh, this all takes place over a period of time. The uh, the shield, the heat shield that will unfold later, uh, unpacks a little bit from the, its compact position. Telescope moves up and off of the, um, the original launch position. These flaps that deploy are to help control the positioning and orientation of the telescope. And then the begins to kind of now we're six days after the launch. We see the, the heat shield being pulled away, uh, they're forming a large sort of insulation platform that protect, will protect the telescope from sun. The telescope has to be kept extremely cold in order to work in the infrared. And this heat shield always remains between the telescope and the Earth, between the telescope and the sun, between the telescope and the moon. To protect the telescope from the heat from the sun or from the moon. This uh, the support structure and folds, the locks are secondary layer onto plate, and then the new segments are formed to produce the uh, full diameter mirror that we use for selective observations in space. I'm going to go on from here. Let's see if I can go on now. There we go. Uh, it's now unfolded. Where has it gone? This is what I think is one of the most interesting things about the Webb Space Telescope. It orbits beyond the Earth at a position that we call Lagrangian point two, L2 for short. This is an empty point in space beyond the Earth and Moon. Um, and because of the combined gravity of the Earth and Sun, it has exactly the same orbital period as the Earth. So even though this, this telescope is a million miles away, it orbits the sun in exactly one year, just as the earth does. So here the graphics are not to scale, but it, it shows the, it, the relative sizes of these things are certainly not to scale, nor are the positions. But the telescope is uh, about three quarters of a million miles, a little over a million kilometers, further out from the sun than the earth. And the question is, why do we put it there? Um, it's an odd place to locate something, but it's a very good place for the Webb Space Telescope. It's able to track the Earth and stay at a constant distance from the Earth as it orbits around this empty point in space that we call Lagrangian II. And because of this, it can always keep its heat shield between the telescope and the sun, Earth, and moon to protect the telescope from, uh, from the heat of the sun and the Earth. So this L2 point is, a, is one of five different points that are... are uh, arranged by the gravity of the Earth and Sun, uh, where at each of these points, L1, L2, L3 on the opposite side of the Sun, L4 and L5, the orbital period around the Sun is exactly one year, just like the Earth. So this is a basically stable point at L2 where uh, the telescope will track with the Earth as it goes around the Sun. At L4 and L5, they are, are more stable points 
And we actually do collect small asteroids at those locations that, that orbit the sun uh, 60 degrees ahead of and behind the Earth. So this is actually a really good place to put this telescope, but it's kind of an unusual location to think about. The first things that happened once Webb reached its orbit around the sun um, and was ready to begin work was to point the telescope at a very bright star, a relatively bright star, and look at the images produced by each of the individual segments of the mirror. Here they are on the image on the, on the left, a numbered uh, A, C3, A5. Um, these are all individual hexagonal segments. And this is the first image that they obtained uh, pointing at this bright star. You can see these images are a bit out of focus and they're scattered all over the plane of the, of the image. They're not organized in any particular way. So the first tax the engineers had was to uh, identify which image is which, and then to move the mirrors, the individual segments of the primary mirror, to put the, these individual star images into a pattern where they could sort of mimic the pattern of the mirrors themselves. And then they were able to focus each of these individual segments so that they produce uh, an in-focus image of light. After they did that, they were then able to combine all of the individual mirror images into a single image in the center. Here we have this really bright star that they were using to set up the telescope. Those six rays that you see penetrating out are an optical artifact from the a support structure of the secondary mirror. In the background of this image, you can see a lot of uh, faint galaxies that are uh, there in beyond, maybe way beyond the, the Milky Way in the background of this star. And these were the first galaxies that the, the telescope actually uh, detected as it was uh, beginning its, its work after the telescope was aligned and the mirrors were, were synced together. The science goals for this telescope are uh, important ones for astronomers. This telescope gives us the opportunity to see the very first stars and galaxies that were formed in the universe after the Big Bang more than 13 billion years ago. This was one of the first images released last uh, July. It's an image of a galaxy cluster. So most of the brightish, whitish looking points, the fuzzy things that you see in this image are very distant galaxies. They're at a, a distance of a few billion light years away. Um, there are stars also visible in this image and you can recognize them by the six pointed objects. Those are our, our optical artifacts from the telescope. And the third group of objects you might recognize in this image or might not recognize in this image are those sort of archy looking things, those sort of extended uh, semi-circular partial arcs. Those are very distant galaxies that are much further away in space, nearly 13 billion light years away that are formed by the gravitational lens of this intervening galaxy cluster. They focus the light from the more distant galaxies into these distorted images and allow us to actually detect, measure, and study galaxies much more distant than the ones uh, that we see in this, in the relative, relatively nearby a galaxy cluster of the fuzzy galaxies in this, uh, in this image. So this was an extremely exciting image for all of us to see as it came off uh, the telescope right at the beginning. And it's just, um, for me, I look at it and I get excited every time I see it. And we'll come back to this and see some other interesting things in this image uh, as, we, as we move forward. The second important uh, science goal of the James Webb Space Telescope is to understand what's happened to galaxies since they formed early following the Big Bang. And this telescope allows us to see far more detailed images of relatively nearby galaxies. This particular image is a picture of Stefan's Quintet. It's a small group of galaxies in the relatively nearby universe, distance of about 300 million light years, so relatively close to us. And you can see uh, these all are galaxies that are relatively close together. They form a small galaxy group. These galaxies are interacting with each other and that's distorting the images themselves. So you see these sort of, uh, of tails that are coming off from the galaxies, the two in the sort of in the middle of the, of the image. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you see two very bright lumps here. These are two galaxies that are interacting very closely throwing off these large tails of gas due to the gravitational interactions. Here we have another large tail being thrown off in the galaxy on the upper left. The galaxy on the upper right is just beginning to interact with this group. Um, but this telescope allows us to see 
in much greater detail what's happening in these galaxies. We can see the infrared images that show us the gas in these galaxies and how that gas is interacting, what's happening to it as these galaxies interact and allows us to study in much more detail how galaxies have formed and merged through the history of the universe. The galaxy in the lower left, the, the awkward looking one that has, um, is, is actually a, not part of this group. It is uh, aligned on the line of sight, but it's much closer. It's only about 40 or 50 uh, uh, light years, uh, millions of light years away from us. So much, much closer. And we can see a lot more detail of the gas inside this galaxy, which is relatively undisturbed, how the gas is shaped and distributed within the galaxy. So the Hubble, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope really allows us to see uh, much more detail about the galaxies and understand their evolution as they have formed and interacted throughout the history of our galaxy. The third really important goal of the James Webb Space Telescope is to actually study exoplanets, so things very near nearby. Um, and I've picked out this one in particular because it shows the power of what we can do with the James Webb Space Telescope. This is an infrared spectrum. So a spectrum is breaking the light into its various colors. Uh, in detail, the, the little dots you see with the air bars going up and down through them are the actual data that are observed of this particular uh, spectrum of an exoplanet. This is a, a planet that is orbiting around the star WASP-39. Um, it's a relatively nearby star. It has a giant planet that orbits around it. That giant planet is uh, bigger than Jupiter, but orbiting very close to the star. It has an orbit that's about four days long. So it orbits its year is only four days long. It's very close to the star. The planet is very hot. It has a temperature of about 1600 degrees. So its atmosphere is very hot. And uh, by looking in detail at the spectrum, we can compare it with models. Knowing the temperature, we can compute what uh, molecules might be present in the atmosphere of the planet, and then compare what we observe with the predicted uh, molecules that we think ought to be there. Here, this particular image is color-coded so that we can see uh, emission from, for example, carbon dioxide, the purple uh, color. We can see emission probably from carbon monoxide uh, and water as well in this particular image. We can begin to study the constituents of the atmosphere of this particular planet. And the people who study these atmospheres believe they've detected water, carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, and a number of other elements or molecules as well in the atmosphere of this particular exoplanet. This particular star, 39, WASP-39, is located in the constellation Virgo. It's marked in the little red dot here in this image, uh, pointed with the red arrow. Uh, this star is about only 700 light years away from us. Um, and the planet has a mass and diameter, or actually a diameter of about 1.3 times the diameter of Jupiter, but a much hotter temperature. Jupiter's temperature is just a couple of hundred degrees. Uh, so, well, a degrees above, above um, absolute zero. So a very, very cold atmosphere. This Jovian-like planet, which actually has been named Boca Prins, it has its own particular planetary name, uh, is a much, much hotter uh, planet. At 1600 degrees, it's much hotter than my oven gets at home. So uh, not a safe place to go, but an interesting one to study as we begin to learn about these exoplanets in the universe. Another important uh, science goal from the James Webb Space Telescope is to study the formation of stars in the universe. And I think this image is, is one of the most iconic that's come from the James Webb Space Telescope. I see it on t-shirts, I see it everywhere on the web these days. And this is an image of a star forming region toward the direction of the constellation Carina in the Southern Hemisphere. This is a very active, very massive star formation region. There are hundreds, even thousands of stars forming in this area of the sky. This image by uh, being in the infrared allows us to study the gas and the dust from which the stars are forming in this region and to begin to understand this process of how stars form uh, from this the condensation of gas and dust in these immense uh, uh, interstellar clouds that we find in the Milky Way. This edge of the cloud you see is a uh, edge that's being formed by the formation of, of stars at the top of this picture and above the picture 
that are sort of blowing the gas and dust away from the region where the stars are forming. But we're still seeing stars forming within the region of the gas and dust itself. One of the re reasons for moving into the infrared with the James Webb Space Telescope is that this gas and dust is more transparent than optical light is. Uh, it, we can see sort of through some of the gas and dust in the infrared where it's completely opaque in the visible invisible light. And that means that we're able to really study these regions of star formation and understand how those stars are forming, where they're forming, how they're interacting with the gas, um, what kinds of stars are forming at great depth within the gas itself. And so this gives us a tremendous opportunity to understand the star formation in the universe. Uh, Webb also allows us to study how stars die. And this also is one of those iconic uh, first light images that was released to the public. This is the uh, Southern Ring Nebula, uh, very similar to the Ring Nebula that many of you have probably seen images of in the Northern Hemisphere. But this one is in the Southern Hemisphere at a distance of about 2,500 light years. And this particular image was taken through several different uh, narrow band or broadband filters at different infrared wavelengths. And then those images were, the, of the different, fil uh, different filter images were combined by translating the infrared images, uh, basically monocrat monochromatic gray images, assigning colors to different wavelength regions and then putting them together to produce a color image. And here we're seeing two different color renditions using different parts of the infrared spectrum to see what uh, this nebula, this, this nebula looks like at different parts of the infrared spectrum, emphasizing different aspects of the, uh, of the object itself and how the gas is distributed, what the temperatures and densities of the gas that's being ejected from these central stars are. And of course, the surprise in this image is in the, the uh, image on the right, where suddenly we see two stars. We see only one on the left, but on the right, we see that the central star of this nebula is actually a binary. It's two stars orbiting around each other. One of these stars is dying. It's ejected a significant amount of its mass into interstellar space and, and exposed the very hot core at the center of the star. Uh, that core has heated the gas that's expanded around the star and caused it to glow in the infrared at different wavelengths. And so this uh, study of infrared light allows us to really understand the structure of how uh, these stars eventually die. This is another of my favorite images. This one was obtained uh, much later from the James Webb Space Telescope, but shows an interaction of two other binary stars. And you see these interesting shells of gas that have been ejected from the binaries. This, um, these two stars orbit around each other in a regular period. And as they approach each other, they eject a shell of gas each orbit. Um, and that's what we see in these, these regular space shells surrounding the star in the middle. I've selected a couple of pictures of Jupiter just because I think they're very interesting. Uh, these were taken also with the James Webb Space Telescope and allow us to study the hazes and high altitude material, understand the clouds of Jupiter. We can see the rings in these images and some of the Jovian moons. Um, so it gives us a really detailed view that allows us to study the planet on a regular basis and understand its weather. Two other uh, planets that were uh, imaged with, with the James Webb Space Telescope are Neptune, here shown with its rings and some of its moons. Uh, the bright spots you see on the planet itself are uh, clouds uh, ab above the atmosphere of the, of the planet. And then these beautiful rings that we know that, that, uh, that Neptune has. And more recently, a picture of Uranus was obtained with the James Webb Space Telescope. This is an interesting planet because it orbits uh, with its, or it rotates with its its rotational axis pretty much in the plane of its orbit. And so as it orbits around, we actually see its north pole, uh, not, not its equator, but its north pole. So its bright region that you see there is the north polar cap. And this is one of the nicest images that we've ever seen of the rings of Uranus. It's got a beautiful set of rings. And in fact, some new ones that were discovered with this image taken with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, just in comparison, uh, here is a, a sample of images seen with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, some in the infrared, some in the optical, and those same galaxies now imaged with the James Webb Space Telescope. So you can see two advantages of these galaxies with Webb are much sharper. We see far more detail. They're much brighter. We get more light. 
So the large size of the telescope and its collecting area and its resolution and its, its ob observations in the infrared allow us to study these galaxies in much more detail than we could have done with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this iconic image, again, comparing Hubble and James Webb, we see the uh, pillars of Hercules, the pillars of creation on the left image taken with Hubble, and that same view taken with James Webb Space Telescope, again, where we can see through the clouds in much more detail and understand the uh, interactions of the gas and stars in this uh, intense star forming region with the, the pillars and the, and the new stars forming in the nebula. Uh, another interesting object is this a picture of the bright star Fomalhaut. Many of you have seen this star in the, in the night sky, uh, but we know that there are rings around the star itself. And uh, Webb was able to take this lovely image, which allows us to see the inner rings around the star. It's possible that we, uh, these rings are formed by planets, but we have yet to detect planets in uh, around Fomalhaut itself. But we know that it has rings that are characteristic of what we would expect if it formed planets. We also occasionally see these bright spots. One of them is marked with a rectangle there. Um, and we believe these are due to collisions of a sort of asteroid particles that are orbiting in the rings. And the collisions produce a large amount of dust. That dust uh, brightens and expands and eventually fades. Um, so we know that there are particles here that can collide and produce dust but we have yet to detect actual planets. Um, recently, uh, the Space Telescope folks announced a brand new baby cluster of galaxies that is just 650 million years old um, that have been detected again with the Webb Space Telescope. Those little teeny galaxies you see in the, in the little boxes in the larger image, we see the, the close-up images of those in the boxes in the middle of this particular picture. They found a pile of these things these baby galaxies appear to be part of a, of a brand new cluster of galaxies forming just after uh, the Big Bang itself, less than a billion years after the Big Bang. And by looking at the, at the distribution and the masses of these baby galaxies, astronomers have suggested that this uh, cluster of galaxies is probably in the last uh, 12 billion years has grown into a giant cluster of galaxies. We can see them here because of the uh, gravitational lensing effect due to the brighter galaxies we see, the whitish ones scattered all through this image. They have allowed us to have magnified the brightness of the galaxies in the background that have allowed us to see this very, very distant and faint cluster of very, very young galaxies. And finally, I want to talk about the sparkler galaxy. So we know in the universe today that we have in our own Milky Way uh, about 150 of these beautiful star clusters. This particular star cluster I've selected here is NGC 362. This is the Hubble Space Telescope image. We know that these star clusters are extremely old. Most of them formed about 12 billion years ago, so back when the universe was very, very young. Uh, but we still see these globular clusters in our Milky Way today, even though they were formed long, long ago. And they're just intense balls of stars. Many of them contain millions of stars. And those stars are still shining in our universe today. But we'd like to understand the formation of these clusters way back when the universe was very young. And this gravitational lensing effect that I've mentioned several times is what allows us to begin to see some of these really, really old uh, star clusters when they were just babies back in the early universe. So here we have an example of how this gravitational lensing works. We have a very far away galaxy. Its light passes through a less far away cluster of galaxies that focuses the light uh, as it passes through due to the gravity of the, of the many galaxies in this large cluster. And that focusing of light allows us to detect the much further away galaxy. And I wanna zero in on this particular piece of that image I showed you right at the beginning. And I'm gonna go into that square image and um, focus in on that and then look at the baby globular clusters that we see. Oh, where is this one? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's go back. Well, I'm gonna show you this anyway. I'm going to show you a close-up of this sparkler galaxy, which is located uh, at, the, at the wrong end of this um, arrow in the middle of the picture on the right. But let's go to the blow-up of this particular galaxy. What we see around this galaxy, uh, which has been magnified by a powder factor of 100 by the gravitational lensing, we see it surrounded by all of these bright yellow dots. And these bright yellow dots are... Uh, 
baby globular clusters. So these are the things that are forming very early in the universe. Each of these sparkles is a star cluster containing probably a million stars uh, that will continue to be part of this galaxy for the next billions of years um, and are very similar to the globular star clusters that we see in our Milky Way today. I wanted to mention just briefly the next big thing, which is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. This is another space telescope that's scheduled to be launched in 2027. It has a, about a three mirror diameter primary mirror. It will do a deep survey of distant galaxies and also look for planets in our own Milky Way. So we're really excited about the coming launch of this one, which will also conduct important research and answer really amazing questions for astronomers down the road. Its science goals are to study the nature of dark energy in the universe, to search for exoplanets in the bulge of our own galaxy, and to answer even more questions about the natures of stars and galaxies through the surveys that it will do. So I wanna conclude here by saying astronomy is looking up. James Webb is doing pretty well so far. We're very excited about what it's doing and what we hope to do with the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. And to tell you that the, a lot of the fun of astronomy is being able to share what we're learning with all of you, with our colleagues, with our students. Um, it, it's an exciting time to be an astronomer. And we see that in the growth of our own undergraduate program. Uh, those of you who were students with us years ago may remember not so many majors, but we're up to nearly 50 majors now in the department. Last year, we graduated uh, 18 or 19 students. It's a record for us. And it's just wonderful to have so many undergraduates in our program now. They, they are uh, an important part of our department. We love having them here. They bring excitement and energy to our program. And we're thrilled to keep up and keep track of them as they become alumni and remain our friends as we move forward. I wanted to give you an opportunity to track us if you'd like. Our Twitter account is IU Astro, and we welcome you to explore our website, www.astro.indiana.edu. We're excited to be here and very excited to share the wonderful things in astronomy with all of you. So I'll stop here and I'd be happy to take your questions. And there are some questions, uh, Katie, that I'll uh, refer to you and I'm sure you will enjoy the, the questions as much as we've enjoyed the answers and what you presented to us. Uh, I'd like to start off with one of my own questions, the scale of what you're talking about. We start with the Earth and the solar system. Then we start with the Milky Way galaxy. And then we start with the cluster that the Milky Way is in. Uh, it, it's truly mind boggling. And this must be something that, that uh, perhaps you lose sleep over. Is that right? You know, it gives us a perspective on the universe that we're one small planet in an amazing solar system in a spectacular galaxy. Um, it's humbling, really, to be an astronomer. I, it's 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 difficult to conceive how much we have learned about the universe, how big the universe is, how old it is, how exciting and complex it is. It actually humbles me. Uh, I one of the things that drew me to astronomy originally was the idea, you know, those stars are just points of light, and yet when we look at them with our telescopes, when we measure what they're made of, when we look at their motions in space, when we look at their distributions in space, when we see them in other galaxies, how powerful the human mind is to conceive of where we are in space, how we relate to all of these magnificent structures that we find in the universe. I love being an astronomer and I just love sharing all of this um, it's, it's just an, an astounding universe that we're part of. So it humbles me, uh, but it also gives me a sense of pride as a human being that we can understand uh, this universe, at least at the level we do. There's so much more to learn, but it's, it's an exciting place. We have a question from Michael. How confident are you of the distance estimates to these various celestial objects? Um, the distance estimates vary, our confidence varies with the distances. So for the nearest stars, we can be pretty confident. Um, the European Southern Observatory has had operations uh, in operation for several years, a uh, Gaia mission that is measuring the parallaxes of 
nearby, or actually a billion stars in the Milky Way. And that allows us to get pretty accurate distances to uh, a large part of the, of the stellar component of the Milky Way. And once we calibrate the distances to stars using these parallaxes, we're able to develop techniques that we call standard candles. These are objects in the universe whose brightness we know pretty exactly. So things like um, supernova explosions or Cepheid variable stars, uh, we can we know their specific brightness. We know how bright they really are. If we measure how bright they look in the sky, that gives us a pretty good measure of, of how far away they are. And astronomers have spent decades trying to develop these techniques to measure distances. I would say for the most distant galaxies, our uncertainties are probably on the order of about 10%. And for the most nearby stars, our, gal our distances are uh, much more precise than that, probably down at the 1% level. So uh, we've worked a lot to get those techniques down, and I have a lot of confidence in those things. Uh, a question from Todd. Uh, can you tell what particular stars are made of via this telescope? You talked about the exoatmospheres. Yes. So those exoatmosphere spectra are taken um, in, a, in a complicated way. We first take a spectrum of the star when the planet is not in front of it. And then we take a spectrum of the of the star with the planet in front of it. Some of that starlight passes through the atmosphere of the planet. We divide out the starlight and that leaves us with the spectrum of the planet itself. But we also have the spectrum of the planet, or excuse me, of the star. And from that spectrum of the star, we see uh, a large number of different types of atomic absorptions in the spectrum. We can detect the presence of uh, most of the elements in the periodic table and measure how much of each of those elements there are, how much helium, how much iron, how much calcium, barium, prosodymium, strontium, europium. I could go on and on and on. So we're able to use those spectra to actually measure the compositions of the stars in great detail. And that also then gives us some idea of the composition of the planet as well. What is the a ratio, for example, of iron to silicon or uh, uh, phosphorus to your, to europium, all kinds of different kinds of ratios we can measure. And that gives us some insight into the planet composition and even the planet structure. Uh, when we combine that with the planet uh, gas atmosphere, we can learn a lot about the sort of internal makeup of the planet as well. So it's, it's a time for theorists really scratching their heads and putting these models together to understand what we can from the star's composition, which we can measure pretty accurately, and then using that to understand more about the exoplanets. So I want to follow up uh, along that line with a question from James. Uh, you showed the, the sparkle galaxies and you pointed out the yellow dots. Uh, what other evidence do you have that they're early globulars? Uh, is it a spectra or are there velocities? We don't have spectra or, or uh, velocities of those things yet. Uh, it will take a larger telescope to actually get good spectra of those very, very faint sparkles. Um, but they they have a distribution around their galaxy that looks very much like the distribution of globular clusters around our Milky Way and around other galaxies that we see uh, in the nearby universe, uh, which also show those same kinds of, of phenomena. So just their distribution and their colors gives us a pretty strong sense that they must be globular clusters. Um, another question, um, and this relates to uh, some recent findings about the edge of the universe. I'll use that term. Can you comment on how the findings from the James Webb Space Telescope have affected previous astronomic concepts? I yeah. presume we don't want to go back to Newton. No, but but there is one way in which it's been really, really interesting to watch. I'm a stellar astronomer. I do compositions of stars, but I just love hearing about what's going on in in the edge of space, right? The very earliest, earliest times of the universe. And what, what, we, what we thought we understood was the formation of galaxies that they formed early on in the universe in a very chaotic way. A lot of interactions, mergers, um, not very well-defined galaxies, sort of uh, a lot of pieces coming together and forming very irregular distributions of light. What we've seen with the early observations with Webb 
has been very a few very massive, very well organized galaxies. And that puts a, a contradiction to what we thought we should see with what we're actually seeing with the web. Uh, we do see a lot of poorly formed galaxies, a lot of irregular things, but we also are finding that there are some very massive, very well formed galaxies very early in the universe. We do not yet understand how those formed. So that's an ongoing question that I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of news about over the next months and years. Uh, a question from Sai Ching. Uh, it looked at the, the are you commenting about the binary slide that you showed uh, and the fact that uh, it looks like that there's a common envelope phase that's going through. I'll let you understand what that term means. But <laughs> the question is, What's the time scale? And is it going to be possible to actually watch this system evolve using the James Webb? Probably not. So the time scales, so the time scales for stellar evolution for massive stars are on the order of a million to a few million years. And that's still long compared to the expected lifetime of the Webb Space Telescope, which is around 10 years. There are a few instances, a few phases in the evolution of stars, which can happen very, very quickly, but they're extremely rare. Um, and that particular binary star, uh, we, we will see uh, likely multiple um, new shells of gas emitted, but we won't see fundamental changes in what those shells look like or fundamental changes in the stars themselves during the time that we'll be able to observe it with Webb. Uh, that's one of the frustrations. The advantage of being an astronomer is that we live in a time machine so that we can look at a population of stars that's nearby, uh, understand its properties, particularly with galaxies, understand the properties of nearby galaxies, and then look at populations of galaxies in the past uh, by looking further and further away and get some sense of the evolution of galaxies that way. It's harder to do with stars, though, because they're, um, they don't over, we don't see them over that huge range of time. Uh, I do have another time question that's a little bit more, shall we say, down to earth. These images that we see from the James Webb, what's the typical exposure time? That varies. Um, often they'll take many exposures in a short period of time, depending on the brightness of the object. But a typical exposure time for any of these space telescopes is between, well, it varies by a lot. It could be 20 minutes. It could be over days. So for example, on the Hubble Space Telescope, the Hubble Deep Field images that many of you have probably seen, uh, those images are over tens to hundreds of orbits that they just re-image the same part of sky over and over again. Um, that tends to happen more and the, as the telescopes get a little bit older. Um, and at the moment, the, most of the things that they're wanting to look at, they want to get a quick snapshot and, and see what they can find fairly quickly. There are some longer exposures up to hours, but the majority are in the range of, of 10 minutes to um, to a few tens of minutes. Yeah, in, in the popular press, images have been released in a timely fashion from the James Webb. Uh, Jeff says that there's an, uh, an announcement yesterday that the uh, James Webb may have detected water on an asteroid. Are you aware of this announcement? I hadn't looked at that one yet, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me. We do see water uh, almost everywhere we look. We see, uh, you know, ice on the moon and the craters in the north and south poles of the moon. We see ice on Mars. Uh, the, uh, I hope he's, are we talking about liquid water? Uh, uh, Jeff didn't say. Okay. <laughs> well, we know we see water outgassing from uh, comets and asteroids that get too close to the sun. We know that there's water everywhere. So I wouldn't be too surprised to see uh, ice on an asteroid uh, or, or outgassing of, uh, of water vapor from an asteroid that's being warmed up by the sun. One of the questions uh, from uh, a viewer asked if the James Webb can actually look at the Earth and has it done so? It cannot. And if it did, it would be a catastrophe. So I showed you that wonderful heat shield uh, the temperature on the sun side of that heat shield is around the same as the temperature on the Earth, um, somewhere around uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. 
on the far side of that sun shield, the side that the telescope is on, it is hundreds of degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And, and it needs to be very, very cold in order to work in the infrared. So the telescope is unable to, to move in a way that it allows sunlight or earth shine to fall on the telescope. That heat shield will always be between the telescope and the sun and the earth. And so we are not able to look backwards. We can look out. Obviously, we can look at, at Uranus and, and Jupiter. We can look at Saturn and Mars um, when they're positioned in the right places in the sky. But we can't look backwards with that telescope toward the Earth. Another topic in the popular press is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Can you comment about how it's playing a role in uh, looking at uh, simulations, computer simulations, and predicting the accuracy of those for star formation? Yes. Yes. Um, I think the places where we see the greatest application in astronomy is in the very, very large data sets that are collected uh, in surveys, uh, particularly the kinds of things that the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will do with very, very large surveys with millions of objects. What we're able to do with artificial intelligence and machine learning is to, is to categorize objects that look alike or that behave in the same way. Uh, so we're able to use that artificial intelligence to help us structure and understand what's in very large data sets uh, in a way that um, makes it helpful to discover things that we might not be able to find if we looked at them just one, one at a time. Another way that that's proving extremely helpful is in understanding, for example, gravitational waves, where we get a gravitational wave signal from these gravitational wave detectors on the ground, uh, but the only way to interpret that signal is really to compare it against thousands and thousands or even millions of models that have been generated and look for matches of, of how the properties of, of uh, observed signal compares to uh, the modeling that we can do to understand the distance to a, the source of a gravitational wave, the masses of the gravitational wave, the masses of the objects that are merging in, in the gravitational wave merger, and then understanding as well the orientation and structure, the rotation of the black holes that are emerging in those events. So the, those machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms are playing a really important role in those areas in particular. Okay, um, a question from Mike. Um, he uh, has read, of course, as we all have, the influence of the communication satellites and the, their interference with the images from terrestrial telescopes. Do you have any comments about that? Uh, any suggestions of how that could be managed? It's very frustrating. Uh, one of the investments that the U.S. is making now, which will come online in the next couple of years, is the Rubin Observatory down in Chile. This is an eight-meter mirror that will do a, a sky survey basically every week. It has a very wide field of view. Um, and its its purpose is to look for transient phenomena, to look for things that change, uh, stars and galaxies that where we have uh, things happening and we want to observe them, find them quickly, follow up, understand what's happening in those places. And the, the satellite trails from these dozens, hundreds, even thousands of satellites that are planned uh, for these satellite arrays will be very, very difficult to work from. They produce light trails that cross the um, the images that, that will be taken with the with with the LSST, the Rubin Observatory, and the large surveys that they will do. And it is just going to be catastrophic. I have a colleague here in the department who uh, studies dwarf galaxies. She uses what's called an integral field unit, which is basically a sort of a rectangle rectangular array of optical fibers. She, she points toward a galaxy. And each optical fiber produces a spectrum of, of a point in that galaxy. And even she has found satellite constellations crossing her narrow field of observations. Um, it's just a scary thing. Uh, the, the satellite companies try to tell us it's going to be OK. They try to tell us they can mitigate these problems. And yet it, the tests that we've seen happen are not encouraging. Even reducing the the reflected light, the scattered light that these these uh, satellites produce, hasn't really made the problems go away. Um, so it's it's a, a problem that we're all really deeply worried about. 
I'd like to return. Uh, Isaac has asked a question about the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. And you alluded to that with one of your slides in terms of different wavelengths. Is, are there other features that it will have that will complement the uh, James Webb? It's, it's a primarily an optical telescope that will image uh, a wide, provide a wide field of view. Uh, Webb's field of view is relatively narrow. It doesn't go more than uh, 10 arc minutes or so. So it only looks at a very small patch of sky. The Nancy Grace Roman will have a large field of view. So it will be able to survey lots and lots and lots of, of objects. It'll survey uh, very deeply uh, large fields of view in the sky, larger than Hubble has been able to do as well. Um, the, the survey that that Roman will do that I'm most interested in is a survey of the galactic bulge. Again, this is a this is something that will happen with this gravitational lensing phenomenon. If we have a very high density of stars in the galactic bulge and we monitor the brightness of those stars, we'll occasionally see two stars line up and that will produce a gravitational effect which will magnify the light of the more distant star. If there's a planet involved, it will provide an extra little magnification that will allow us to study the real distribution of planets around stars in the universe. And that's gonna be a powerful new technique for understanding the, the properties of the kinds of exoplanets that we find around stars without so many selection effects as we have with the mechanisms, the, the, the kinds of ways that we study exoplanets today. So I'm super excited with this wide field of view that of what the Nancy Grace Grohman telescope will provide. So we have uh, one more question and time will permit the answer to that. And this is from Joe. How would a similar size telescope on the moon perform compared to the space telescope by like James Webb? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, the first type of telescope we're likely to build on the moon is a, a radio telescope that we could put on the far side of the moon and avoid a lot of radio interference can be built inside of a crater, maybe have a diameter of a kilometer or two, really super big and super sensitive. And there's some hope that a telescope like that on the moon would be able to detect the uh, first clouds of hydrogen that before they formed into the first galaxies. So that's pretty exciting. Optical telescopes on the moon would be uh, fairly comparable to the Hubble Space Telescope in the sense that they would have uh, sunlight on them. Um, it would be hard to operate them in the infrared. Um, the, the moon, uh, as it orbits around the Earth, also rotates. And so it has sunlight uh, for two weeks at every point on the surface of the moon. So uh, a telescope that is elsewhere, large, but elsewhere, uh, where it can all be, be used 24-7, uh, is actually probably better. Uh, but the radio telescope on the moon, I think, is a really exciting prospect. Um, and in fact, it's one of our alumni who's leading that project on the moon. So I'm really excited about that one. And the his or her name? Uh, Jack Burns at the University of Colorado. Good. Amazing, so, amazing telescope. I hope they can build it. NASA needs to do this. So uh, I'm wrapping up. And I want to say that uh, we've talked about uh, the galaxies. We've talked about the edge of the universe. But you need to comment about our most nearest star. What's happening with the sun next year? Oh, <laughs> thank you. So we have an eclipse coming right here in Bloomington. We are almost at the center of the path of totality. April 8th, 2024. And we are so excited about that eclipse. Uh, we're working with the campus. We're working with the community. Uh, we're working with communities around Indiana to prepare for what will happen uh, during the eclipse. How do we handle the visitors? How can we make sure that they have a great experience on campus and here in Bloomington? How can we help schools and teachers and youth organizations, everyone, churches prepare for this eclipse? I hope you'll all be coming to join us for the eclipse. It's gonna be a fantastic time. Um, Three and a half minutes of totality, I understand. Is that correct? Four minutes. Four minutes, it's very right here. long. Yeah. Uh, we have we have a group. Uh, we're participating with a project with uh, the Southwest Research Institute in um, in Colorado to produce a movie of the solar corona during the eclipse. And uh, one of our st students and one of our physics faculty just got back from a trip to Australia 
to practice down there with a 50 second eclipse. But the four minutes here is going to be so much better. Well, thank you again, Katie. It's just been a delightful conversation with you virtually. And I hope that the people attended can share the excitement that I had over hearing you talk. So I'm going to return it now to Vanessa for closing comments. Thank you again for joining us and participating in this evening's live stream. I would like to personally thank Professor Pilachowski and Dr. Kovner for their time and expertise. We are grateful to you all. Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support who, of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. If you would like to support programs like tonight's presentation or other opportunities that connect alumni and friends with the College of Arts and Sciences, please consider making a contribution to the IU Bloomington College Alumni Engagement Fund at the Indiana University Foundation. Until next time, please take care and stay safe.